drove out of the military base at RAF Crowton and turned left onto the B4031 towards Crowton village. It was about 8.20 in the evening. There was good visibility. Two of your own children were in the back of your car. When you turned, you immediately went onto the wrong side of the road where you traveled for about 350 meters. Just less than 30 seconds later, your car hit the motorcycle being ridden by Harry Dunn, who was just 19 years old. He had spent the 27th of August 2019 with his best friend. He was happy. He loved motorbikes. There is no suggestion that he was driving anything other than entirely properly. He was on the right side of the road, driving perfectly normally. Excessive speed was not involved on either side. At the point of the collision, there was a slight bend and rise in the road. The impact with the front of your car threw him onto the front of your car and then over the top of it until he landed in the road. His bike caught fire and was pushed backwards. Another driver arrived soon afterwards and called the emergency services. You got out, realized what had happened and were very distressed. You spoke to Mr. Dunn who was conscious and speaking. You got your children out of the car and called your husband and the RAF base. You confirmed to the police that what happened was your fault and you had been on the wrong side of the road. A breath test was administered and was negative. You said you had made a mistake. Mr. Dunn suffered multiple severe injuries. He was very gravely ill when he was taken to hospital and he died soon afterwards. You were not arrested at the time. You did not remain in the United Kingdom. You left on the 15th of September 2019. You submitted to a voluntary interview with the police in Washington DC on the 28th of October. As you had at the roadside, you admitted you were responsible. A request for your extradition was submitted in 2020. It was denied. Immunity from criminal prosecution was claimed for you by the government of the United States of America and accepted by the British government. As the High Court of Justice in London found in its judgment on the challenge of Mr. Dunn's parents to that decision, in, in the Crown on the application of Charlotte Charles and Tim Dunn against the Secretary of State for the Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs and the Chief Constable of Northamptonshire Police 2020, EWHC 3185 admin, you did indeed enjoy that immunity at the time of the accident which killed their son. There is no doubt that the calm and dignified persistence of these parents and the family of that young man has led through three years of heartbreak and effort to your appearance before the court and the opportunity for you to acknowledge, acknowledge your guilt of a crime. Eventually you were charged with death by dangerous driving by written requisition pursuant to section three of the Crime International Cooperation Act 2003. Changes in the law wrought by Part 8 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003 by the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act 2022 guaranteed powers or rather granted powers to the criminal courts to permit a person to take part in criminal proceedings through a live link. The Chief Magistrate granted a live link order and you appeared before Westminster Magistrates Court on the 29th of September 2022. Your case was sent to the Central Criminal Court. 
By participating in video link proceedings at Westminster Magistrates, you surrendered to the court. When your case was sent for trial to this court, you were given unconditional bail. Surrender to this court was accomplished when you were identified as being present again by video link on the 20th of October 2022. You were arraigned and you pleaded guilty to a lesser offence, that of causing death by careless or inconsiderate driving, contrary to section 2B of the Road Traffic Act 1988. The court granted a live link for your arraignment because, in my judgment, it was in the public interest for you to be able to enter your plea and it would not defeat the interests of justice if that was accomplished by you participating through a live link. At no point in these proceedings had it been suggested that you were not free and able to travel to this jurisdiction in person. Once you had pleaded guilty and were therefore a convicted offender, there could be little reason in a case where a young man had met his death for you not to be required to attend at court for sentence. Your bail was not withdrawn and you were released from the court but directed to attend in person for this sentencing hearing. I directed you to attend and observed that attendance in person would be strong evidence of remorse. For the purpose of Section 6.1 of the Bail Act 1976, you had a duty to surrender to the court. Failure of a defendant in a criminal trial to attend in person when directed to do so without reasonable cause is an offence contrary to the Bail Act. It has the potential to affect the court's ability to administer justice by damaging the confidence of victims, witnesses and the public more generally in the effectiveness of the court system. Judges have to consider taking appropriate action if there is no sufficient justification for a failure to attend. The usual action is to issue a bench warrant not backed for bail, which will result in the arrest of the defendant when they are located. Your sentence is due to take place on the 1st of December. A week before that date, on the 24th of November, the court received a renewal of the application for you to appear by LiveLink. This included references to harassment and threats you and your family had received, mainly by social media and many emanating from the United States of America, and an assessment that this gave rise to a risk to your personal safety if you travelled to the United Kingdom. It did not include any reference to a barrier imposed by the government authorities to your travelling to London to face sentence in person. As a consequence of what the court uh, received, uh, I asked the prosecution to provide a response to the material submitted. Very swiftly, by the 28th of November, the Northamptonshire Police compiled an operation which set out in detail four plans by means of which your safety could be protected if you were to return to the jurisdiction to be sentenced. Accordingly, I maintained my order that the hearing be in person. However, a request was made on your behalf for a delay of a week to obtain further evidence this was allowed. On Friday, the 2nd of December, a statement was served from Amy Jeffries, your attorney who accompanies you today. And I granted the application on Monday, the 5th of December. The reasons were that for the first time in these criminal proceedings, a barrier to your attendance emanating from the American government was relied on in support of the application. In her statement, Ms. Jeffries says, quote, the US government does not in any way support Mrs. Sekoulis's appearing in person at this hearing. In fact, Mrs. Sekoulis's US government employer has advised her not to return to the United Kingdom in person for this hearing because her return could place significant US interests at risk. 
This advice was communicated to her by her employer on the 30th of November, and she is not at liberty to disclose the communication itself or any further information to the court. By section 51, subsection 3 of the Criminal Justice Act 2003, as amended by section 200 of the PCSCA 2022, a sentencing hearing falls within the list of eligible criminal proceedings for which the court has the power to make a direction pursuant to section 51, subsection 1. And that power may be exercised in respect of a person who is outside the jurisdiction of England and Wales. But the power is subject to section 51, subsection 4a, which requires that the court is satisfied, amongst other things, that it is in the interests of justice to make the direction. The interests of justice in a criminal case are frequently different to the interests of the defendant. Respect for the law must be genuine and effective, substantial and real. The Lord Chief Justice has provided the courts with guidance which must be considered alongside all the circumstances of the case, in particular factors which are set out in section 51 subsection 6 of the CJA. One of those factors is the need for the defendant to attend in person. Paragraph 9 of the guidance issued by the Lord Chief Justice invites attention to such factors as the potential penalty to be imposed and in paragraph 18, whether a live link would risk damaging international relations so as to be contrary to the interests of justice. When sentence is to be imposed for an offence that involves a fatality, there must be a strong public interest in the offender being before the court in person. In other words, a need for the defendant to attend in person. As will become apparent, I concluded, provisionally and subject to hearing the submissions in mitigation today, that the barrier presented by your adherence to the advice given to you by your government employer was relevant to my decision on the use of a live link, and it would not interfere with the due administration of justice given the sentence I was likely to impose. The alternatives would have been to withdraw your bail if you had not attended today, the result would have been a warrant for your arrest, which would have been extant until executed or withdrawn. The issuing of a warrant for your arrest would have been close to an empty gesture, and it would stall progress in this case. Another option open to the court would have been to conduct sentence in your absence, as you are represented by counsel, and the court has material upon which to proceed. It would have been perverse to, review, to refuse this video link in these circumstances. And on the 5th of December, I granted the application, which remained a joint one by the defence and the prosecution. In an eloquent impact statement, Charlotte Charles, Harry Dunn's mother, has expressed her sorrow at not being able to comfort her son as he lay on the side of the road or in hospital. She is full of regrets. Her other son, Harry's na twin, Niall, feels emptiness. The deep suffering of the entire family at the unusual course of events I have outlined has generated the persistence that she and, her, uh, and Harry's father have shown. She wants justice for her son, as she promised him. Although they've been left with a gaping hole, the family is determined to provide a legacy for him in projects to help others. Who are you, Anne Sekoulas? You are a citizen of the United States of America. You are 45 years old and happily married with three children of your own, aged 7, 9 and 14 years. You accompanied your husband on his posting to RAF Crowton having arrived a few weeks before the accident. You had been socialising on the base on the 27th of August with your husband and children. He left the base shortly before you, and according to the material before me, you decided to drive home the way he did 
even though you are less familiar with it than another route that you knew. You have expressed your condolences to Mr Dunn's family through a statement read by Council on your behalf at this hearing. Causing death by careless or inconsiderate driving, contrary to Section 2B of the Road Traffic Act 1988, can be committed in various ways. Sometimes a moment's inattention can lead to tragic results. This is not such a case. You drove along the wrong side of the road for much more than a moment, and you did not realise what you were doing, even when you were coming to a bend in the road when all drivers on a narrow carriageway would naturally check that they were driving safely. It seems to me that your conduct, albeit careless rather than deliberate, falls at the other extreme. Taking everything into account, your behaviour on this occasion was not far short of deliberately dangerous driving, which results in a death. I bear in mind that this was a short period of driving and you were not familiar with English roads. The Sentencing Council guideline places the starting point for sentence for your offence at 15 months custody. The range it provides is nine months to three years custody. The death of Harry Dunn is of course the highest degree of harm, but that is inherent in the charge and the starting point of 15 months. There are none of the aggravating features that may appear in some such cases. For example, you are not driving uninsured. There is mitigation in your case. In particular, you are not compelled to submit yourself to this charge and these proceedings, but have chosen to do so. You had only limited experience of driving in this country. You offered assistance to Mr Dunn at the scene, and you have never personally denied responsibility for his death. Other features, such as the short time you drove before the collision, also alleviate the gravity to a degree. You are to be treated as of good character, apart from two minor driving matters in 1997 and 2006, both of which resulted in fines. Anyone who has caused death by driving would be expected to feel remorseful. But remorse is important for sentencing purposes, and I accept that you felt and feel genuine remorse. These features require a reduction in the starting point, and I allow three months. You indicated a guilty plea to this offence in the Magistrates Court and you entered your guilty plea at the first opportunity in the Crown Court. The law requires a one-third discount to recognise this. The shortest term of imprisonment commensurate with the seriousness of the offence is therefore eight months imprisonment. It follows that the offence is so serious that neither a fine alone nor a community sentence can be justified for it. Imprisonment must always be the last resort. Your offence passes the custody threshold, as I have indicated, but before deciding that no alternative is appropriate, I have considered whether that can be avoided. I ordered a pre-sentence report at the last hearing. You will have seen that report. The author has provided me with a great deal of useful information about you and she has consulted senior officers and officials at His Majesty's Prison and Probation Service. However, the author concludes with no recommendation to the court and state that her inquiries do not reveal any practical way in which a form of community sentence or any other non-custodial disposal imposed by this court could be managed in the United States of America. It is obvious that no enforcement can be carried out and no breach of an order could be prosecuted effectively while you remained abroad. Equally, no restorative justice process can take place except in person. I'm grateful to the probation service for the inquiries they've made. Council on your behalf has submitted that sentence should be deferred and that you would arrange to do some form of voluntary work in recompense. 
I do not consider that there is any purpose in deferring sentence. As the pre-sentence report makes clear, you are not someone who needs rehabilitation. You need to be sentenced, and then both you and the family of Harry Dunn can move on. If I were to impose an immediate custodial sentence, then you would be unlawfully at large thereafter, and I would order you to return to the United Kingdom to serve it. The sentence will be put into effect if and when you enter the jurisdiction and surrendered to a police station. Before doing so, I have considered whether it is possible to suspend the sentence. You have the strong personal mitigation I have already summarised. You are also a mother of young children who would suffer disproportionate harm from your immediate imprisonment, and I am satisfied that appropriate punishment can be achieved without immediate custody. Please stand up, Mrs Sekoulas. You are disqualified from driving for 12 months for the offence of causing the death of Harry Dunn by your careless driving. The sentence is eight months' imprisonment, suspended for 12 months. There will be no additional requirements. The sentence means that if in the next 12 months you commit any offence, whether or not it is of the same type for which I am sentencing you today, you would find yourself before the court again, and it is likely that the sentence will be brought into operation, either in full or in part. Thank you very much. You may sit down. That was, uh, of course, uh, Mrs uh, Justice uh, Chima Grubb uh, passing her sentence uh, on Anne Sekoulas. Uh, the bottom line there, uh, which we reached at, at the end, was uh, that uh, Ms Sekoulas uh, will be disqualified from driving uh, for 12 months uh, and received an eight-month prison sentence suspended uh, for 12 months. And those final moments there uh, from Mrs Justice uh, Chima Grubb uh, explained why she felt uh, the prison sentence of eight months, though warranted, uh, needed to be suspended uh, and just all arguments of practicality uh, meant it needed to be suspended because she could not uh, submit herself to prison in the UK uh, immediately. A sort of way out, perhaps, uh, you could frame that, of uh, all the complications uh, of this particular case. Let's get uh, immediate reaction from uh, someone who knows this case incredibly well. Sky correspondent uh, Lisa D Dowd is outside at Old Bailey. And... Uh, there was a prison sentence there, Lisa, albeit suspended, uh, passed there by Mrs Justice Chima Grubb. Yes, um, during that sentencing, uh, Mrs Justice Chima Grubb um, took us through the details of that night and the aggravating factors, particularly that Mrs Sekoulas had been on the wrong side of the road for quite a long time, up to 26 seconds before she hit Harry Dunn. Um, but what Mrs Chima Grubb pointed out uh, was that... Um, there were no aggravating factors. Um, she hadn't been drinking alcohol, she hadn't been speeding, and she took into account mitigation that Mrs Sekoulas had voluntarily taken part in these proceedings, that she'd offered assistance to uh, Harry Dunn as he lay dying at the scene, that she uh, freely admitted her part in his death and that she was of good character, except for two uh, minor driving offences in the US um, a number of years ago. And the judge accepted uh, that Mrs Sekoulas did feel uh, genuine remorse for what had happened. So, um, passing sentence, she sentenced... Uh, she asked Mrs Sekoulas, who was on video link, uh, from Washington to stand up and she told her that she was disqualified from driving for 12 months and that she would have an eight-month suspended prison sentence and if she was to commit any further offence in the next 12 months that she would be brought before the court again. Of course, all of this has been voluntary for Mrs Sekula, so um, if anything further was to happen, it would be up to her whether she took part in uh, any uh, further proceedings. Now we await uh, the reaction from Harry Dunn's family, who have been in court listening to that intently. Um, they have always said they didn't particularly expect any kind of custodial sentence. Um, they just 
just wanted to see Mrs Sakoulas face justice in a UK court. They had been happy for this to happen remotely, uh, but they would have preferred that she had come for sentencing back to the United Kingdom. And the judge um, took us through uh, some of the detail in the run-up to this court hearing. Um, she felt there was little reason for Mrs Sakoulas not to return to the UK uh, to the Old Bailey today. She had directed to her to attend. Um, we heard a bit of background detail uh, some of the legal wranglings going on in the background um, with regards to her attendance. Mrs Sakoulas and her lawyers had claimed that she had been harassed on social media. She didn't feel safe coming back to the UK. And at one point, there was no reference to the United States government, her employer, being a barrier uh, to her coming back. Point that changed a couple of days ago, and her lawyers said uh, that the US government did not want her to return in person um, because it would place significant US interests at risk. So she is uh, via video link from the United States. Um, Harry Dunn's family are in court. They'll be coming out to give their reaction shortly. And Lisa, we of course uh, await that uh, reaction. Uh, it, it is a moment that might uh, provide them some closure, uh, albeit of course uh, we heard also uh, earlier from uh, the uh, victim impact statements that she'll never be able to really get over this from Harry Dunn's mother. I think they found some closure from the very first uh, time that they saw Mrs Sakoulas in court. Um, and they are happy to see her in court via video link again. But as I've said, they would have preferred to see her here in person. Um, they have perhaps been filled in a little bit more about the background to what happened to Harry that night. We heard in court uh, that the whole collision had been caught on airbase cameras at RAF Croton in Northamptonshire uh, back in August 2019, that Mrs Sakoulas had driven out of the airbase. Mrs Chima Grubb, um, the judge, had been describing how um, the Sakoulas family had been socialising at the airbase, um, that they had left the airbase in separate cars, uh, Mrs Sakoulas following her husband who um, left the base and she though pulled onto the wrong side of the road. She was on the wrong side of the road for up to 26 seconds when she was in collision with Harry Dunn. She was on the wrong side of the road. He was on the correct side of the road on a motorbike. Um, the uh, footage captured the moment where they collided. There was an explosion, there was a fire. Harry was thrown from his motorbike over uh, her vehicle, a Volvo, onto the road. And we heard some awful uh, testimony uh, from a witness who was first at the scene. She'd found Mrs Sakoulas, who had her children in the car at the time, at the side of the road. Um, and Mrs Sakoulas told the witness, I've had a head-on collision with a motorbike. It's all my fault. I was on the wrong side of the road. I've only been here a few weeks, referring to the fact that she'd only recently come to the UK and she wasn't familiar with uh, UK roads. And the witness also said how Harry was lying on uh, the road with multiple injuries and he said to her, don't let me die. Um, we heard that Mrs Sakoulas had cooperated uh, with police in the UK, had uh, given interviews and it had not been her decision to claim diplomatic immunity and leave the country. Um, after the crash, that that was taken on her behalf by her employer, the United States government. Um, we heard in her defence that um, she had not been speeding, she had not been drinking, she pleaded guilty at the earliest opportunity. Um, but she said since the crash, um, she had been the subject of harassment, death threats, she's had to move house. Um, she's been diagnosed with a stress-related disorder and she, her uh, lawyers made the point on her behalf that not a day went by where Harry was not on her mind and she wiped away a tear as she heard testimony in court from Charlotte Charles, Harry's mother, who read out victim impact statements and uh, the impact his death had had on her and her wider family um, over the years while they've been trying to get justice for him. Um, Charlotte Charles referred to Harry as the light 
of her life and she said it still haunted her that she hadn't got to hospital in time to be with him uh, before he died and she felt that she'd lost two sons that night because Harry we should remember was a twin and his twin brother Niall has also been suffering terribly with the loss of Harry. Um, Mrs. Um, Charles said, we don't live anymore, we simply uh, just function. And at that point, uh, Mrs. Sekoulas on the video link from Washington wiped away a tear. No doubt. Uh, thanks uh, so much uh, for that. Uh, let's get further analysis now. Joshua Rosenberg uh, uh, joins us uh, as well. And Joshua, first your, your reaction to the sentence uh, itself. Uh, a custodial sentence uh, suspended, though, uh, and therefore unlikely ever to actually be served. That's correct. Uh, unless uh, Anne Sekoulis were to commit other offences in the next 12 months, and unless, of course, she were to return to the United Kingdom, uh, then she won't have to serve that sentence. That's what a suspended sentence is. I think the sentence was straight down the line. Once it was accepted that this was at the top end of the offence, this was careless or inconsiderate driving falling not far short of dangerous driving. Well, the starting point for that in the guidelines which the judges must uh, follow, the starting point for that is 15 months custody. There were mitigating circumstances which allowed the judge to reduce that to 12 months custody, in other words, three months off the starting point. Then, because she pleaded guilty at the first opportunity, it was reduced by a third to eight months um, and that was obviously when Anne Sekoulis must have wondered whether the judge was actually going to impose a sentence of immediate custody, uh, but she decided that she could suspend the sentence, which, as I say, means that uh, in, in practice it won't have to be served. I think one of the very interesting legal aspects to emerge from uh, what Mrs Justice Chima Grubb uh, said to Anne Sekoulis just now is the arrangements with the United States. At the previous hearing, the judge said, uh, you must come back to London for the sentencing. I can't see any reason why you should not. Uh, and then we heard that uh, the lawyers asked for another remote hearing, saying that they didn't want uh, her to come back. Uh, and the judge said, well, why? Uh, and then the lawyers asked for more time. And, and then we had this very interesting uh, 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 message from the US government uh, that uh, she had been advised not to return because this could put US interests at risk. And I think this is a hint at what uh, lies behind uh, this case. Uh, you've been describing Anne Sekoulis as a spy. We don't know exactly uh, what she does. We don't know exactly uh, what her husband does. But there is no doubt they work for the US government. There is no doubt that the base where they worked was a communications station. There was no doubt that they were involved in secret work, uh, and, and that was why they were allowed diplomatic privileges. And what the US government was saying was that if she came back to uh, the UK, that would jeopardise the US national security, and they weren't prepared to explain in what way. Uh, and that seems to have influenced the judge to allow today's hearing to take place remotely, the judge made it clear uh, that if it wasn't for that, uh, then uh, Anne Sekoulis would have been um, in breach of her bail conditions. She would have failed to surrender to her bail as the judge had ordered, uh, and that would have uh, increased her sentence. So the fact that the US government belatedly told the UK uh, through uh, Anne Sekoulis's lawyers that it was important to the US for Anne Sekoulis not to return uh, clearly had an influence on the judge's decision uh, to pass a suspended sentence, as of course did the fact that it's not possible, we heard, for any sentence, not even a community sentence, to be carried out in the United States. So really, uh, the judge was left with no alternative, but she marked the gravity of this case by saying that this was a case that would normally be visited with eight months imprisonment. And well, on that note, Joshua, is it your interpretation uh, of the facts, but, but uh, also what we just heard uh, from the judge, that had Ms. Skoulis been able to be present, the sentence would not have been suspended? If she had returned, uh, that would have demonstrated remorse, which is something that the judge said she would take into account. So I think if she had returned, it would have been better for her than it is at the moment, or at least no worse. 
I think if she had returned, uh, then she would still have received a suspended sentence. Now, the judge made inquiries, and the police were able to work out various ways in which Anne Sekulis could have been returned to the United Kingdom at no risk to herself, uh, presumably brought by a police car through the back entrance of the Old Bailey or something like that. Uh, and then, assuming no custodial sentence was passed, uh, whisked away and returned to the United States. Uh, but we can see that the US government uh, wasn't prepared to take that risk because of what it said would be damage to uh, US interests, would put US interests at risk. Um, and perhaps the US government uh, was wise to take that approach because, as the judge said, this could have been an immediate custodial sentence and Sekulis would have been in prison. Um, people would have tried to get information out of her. Uh, who knows uh, what the risk would have been to the US? So you can perhaps understand uh, why the US took a very firm line on this. Uh, but no, I think if she had returned to the United Kingdom, uh, she might well have received a suspended sentence um, in the same way as she actually did. And, and just finally and quickly, Joshua, I, I'm interested in the fact that she came from the US uh, and her licence was issued by the US and therefore was used to driving on the other side of the road, that that is a mitigating factor. Could, could one not, in layman terms, from which I come, uh, come from, uh, assume quite the opposite, that if you choose to drive in a foreign country uh, and the licence you are doing uh, to do so with your full knowledge comes from different countries, you are responsible for, for the different laws that might apply? You are certainly responsible, and I think the judge made that very clear. The judge made it clear that she should have uh, um, been more cautious as she approached the, the brow of the hill, the bend in the road. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, many of us have driven um, in the US, in the, on the continent. If you are on a motorway, it's no problem at all. The traffic's going in one direction. If you come out of a, a service station of a private road, onto a main road and there's no traffic going in either direction and there are just dotted lines down the middle of the road, I suspect some of us have instinctively driven on the wrong side of the road uh, just for a moment until we suddenly realise, hang on, um, I'm on the wrong side. And that's clearly what happened here. Um, so I think that uh, the judge was showing some understanding of this position, but clearly she thought that even, um, um, you know, if, if somebody momentarily sets out on the wrong side of the road, they ought to think, hang on, um, I'm driving in a foreign country, the rule of the road is different. I think it is a mitigating circumstance, but it does um, show how terribly important it is to be aware as a driver and what a dangerous thing it is to drive a car. Joshua, thanks so much uh, for all your expert analysis uh, throughout the afternoon. Uh, Joshua Rosenberg there. Um, this is the statement, by the way, that was read out on behalf of Anne Sekoulis uh, during the hearing at the Old Bailey. She says, quote, I want to again extend my sincerest condolences to Harry Dunn's family and friends. My tragic mistake led to the loss of Harry, and I live with this regret every single day. There's not a day that goes by that Harry isn't on my mind, and I'm deeply sorry for the pain that I've caused. It's for this reason that I've been so committed to a resolution to this case since 2019. I know there's nothing I can say to change what has happened. I only hope that the truth uh, and a resolution to this case will bring a measure of comfort and peace. As always, I remain willing to meet and apologise to Harry's family directly if that would help, uh, if that support their healing. Harry was a young man with his whole life ahead of him. I cannot imagine the loss, and I too deeply grieve for Harry and his family. I'm grateful that I could express my profound remorse to the court and to Harry's friends and family. August 27th, 2019 changed the lives of so many, and I pray for healing. I kindly ask the media uh, for privacy. And the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverley, has given his reaction. He said, quote, Anne Sekoulis has finally been sentenced in a British court. Since Harry's death in August 2019, we've been clear that Ms Sekoulis should return to the UK to face British justice. Since she chose not to, virtual hearings were arranged and as the most viable way to bring the case to court and give justice to Harry's family. I want to pay tribute to the incredible resolve of Harry's family and I hope that the judgment provides some closure. We've learned important lessons from this tragic incident, including improvements to the process around exemptions from diplomatic immunity 
and ensuring the US takes steps to improve road safety uh, around RAF Croton. Joining me now uh, from uh, the Old Bailey is Nick Vamos, partner at Peter and Peter's Solicitors and the former head of extradition at the Crown Prosecution Service, who was appointed by the Dunn family to advise on securing prosecution for Anne Secours. Thanks so much for, for joining me. Uh, I, I'm interested in, in, first of all, your perspective on the details we learnt uh, today uh, on why Anne Secours was not present in person uh, today, initially making a case that it was based on her own safety uh, and only after a, a late intervention by the US government was it possible for her to remain in the US? Well, I'm sure both were true, that she was concerned for her safety and that the whole time the US government was working to prevent her return. And they obviously didn't want to say that publicly, but were forced to when the judge said that she wouldn't otherwise exclude her uh, or forgive her attendance. So um, the US government were always thought to have been pulling her strings from behind the scenes. And of course, they, they had to then come out from behind the curtain and, and reveal that that was exactly what they were doing. Um, and they said that significant US interests were in play, which is why they had to do that. We don't know what those interests are. I, I can imagine they want to protect all their diplomatic staff anywhere in the world, and they have a, a policy that they don't want people to go back to a country to face prosecution. It's a shame they didn't feel they were able to do that for the UK, where we're meant to be their closest allies. Uh, but that was their decision, and so the judge really had no choice but to deal with it this way. Uh, are you surprised uh, in any way at the sentence? I'm not surprised that the judge brought it to an end today. If she'd imposed a custodial sentence but not suspended it, then the questions would have remained whether justice had yet been done, how would she ever face that sentence, and I think that would have not helped the family. I think at the forefront of the judge's mind was not to cause any more pain to the family uh, and how to achieve that while staying within the guidelines and, and doing something that, that felt like justice. So I think the sentence was the right one, um, and, you know, it feels uncomfortable that we've had to do this remotely from start to finish, that she's avoided extradition, which anybody else would have faced. Um, but I think the sentence is probably what she would have received anyway. Um, we, we are waiting to hear from Harry Dunn's family. In fact, uh, we can listen to them now. OK, are we ready? Everybody? Just a warning as well that there is, uh, as uh, you may have seen already, some flash photography well, here. Let's listen, uh, though, to Harry Dunn's family. Um, everybody, well, we've just come out of what has to be one of the most extraordinary uh, legal cases in, in English history. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. I just want to um, just, again, pay tribute to the courage of the parents. We all heard what the judge said, the, the calm dignified but persistent manner in which they've campaigned for justice for their son, I think is unprecedented, and I'm, I'm just in awe of them. Look, in terms of the, the sentence, it was, it was pretty much everything that we expected. Um, Mrs. Sekoulis, I think, was trying to persuade the court that, sh that, that she should be allowed to uh, do some sort of community service or scrub toilets, clean graffiti. That is not how we do things after the death of somebody in criminal circumstances. And I want to pay tribute also to Mrs. Justice Chima Grubb, who I think has done an outstanding job on behalf of our, our legal system and our country. Just finally from me, before I hand over to my son, Isaac Seeger, who's uh, one of Harry Dunn's childhood friends and wants to say a few words as well before we take questions. Look. Our real enemy here is not Mrs. Sekoulis. We know she made a mistake that night, and, I'm, and I dare say all of us and everybody watching at home has made mistakes on the road. We know she didn't intend to kill Harry. Our real enemy here is the U.S. government, who after Harry's death, instead of coming to do the right thing for this family, decided to kick them in the stomach and continue to kick them in the stomach for three years. And if it weren't for their friends, their community, you guys in the media, and the great British and American public, and millions of people around the world helping us, they would have got away with it. Well, they didn't get away with it today. We all heard the judges' criticisms of the U.S. government. The cowardly approach to 
ensuring that justice is done here, I think is, I think is appalling. And I don't understand why the Americans have behaved this way. But as Isaac will come on to tell you, we finished this part of the campaign today, but we are absolutely determined to make sure this never happens to another British family again. Thank you. Isaac. Okay. So thank you for being here. I, um, I grew up with Harry and Niall through nursery, secondary and uh, primary school. Harry was a great person who was very uh, caring and was taken too soon driving perfectly safely on the right side of the road. Um, the way that the US government has treated with this family with utter disdain, all the family wanted to do and all Charlotte was interested in was to hear an apology and a mere explanation as to what happened. She never wanted to take Anne Sekoulas away from her kids. And a message to the US government from the younger generation is, you're not our friend. This is not how allies treat one another. This has turned into a massive international dispute. But we've, I've spent time with the family every day. And what they have to go through on a daily basis is awful and unacceptable. But this is not an isolated incident. The US government are treating many families like this around the world as much as they try and hide it. Um, and I would just encourage you to, to watch this space as our, me and my team will, will focus on exposing them and fighting them on every corner. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Well said, well said. Right, we're happy to take as many questions for the parents uh, as you like. We've got a bit of time, so um, Lisa, do you want to go first? You guys, if you want to step forward. Um, Charlotte, Tim. Step uh, forward. Lisa from Sky News. Yeah. How are you feeling? Job done. Promise complete. Properly, properly complete now. You know, Anne Coolis has a criminal record for the rest of her life. Um, that was something that, you know, they never, she never thought she'd see, the US government never thought that they'd see. And we've worked tirelessly and relentlessly to make sure that she, in the end, still had to do what you and I would have had to have done. So, yeah, Harry, we've done it. And we're good. We're good. <laughs> Are you happy with the sentence? We would, we would have been happy with anything. We've never been invested in, in what the judge was going to hand down. For us, it was just all about doing that doing the right thing, getting through the UK justice system, and done. Yeah. Mrs Sakula says she's prepared to meet you if that would help. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Too much, too little, too late, I think, isn't it? <laughs> Job's ship, done now. Ship sailed, yeah. That ship sailed. Yeah. You have a chance to do the right thing. You do it at the beginning. You don't wait, wait for three years and put families yeah. through torture and then try to do the right thing when it's going to make you look good. <laughs> it's up to them, but if that, you know, I, I've reached out in Olive Branch to, to them many, many times. Yeah. It's never once been accepted. And, you know, look, I, I, it's up to the parents, but my advice to them is we move forward now. She will have to live uh, with what she's done and the way that they have treated this family for the rest of their lives. We have to live without Harry, but our conscience is clear. And, uh, yeah. 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 Can you reflect, Charlotte, what you told the court in your victim impact to the state? What this has done to you as a family? Really? <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Um, brokenness. You know, everything I said in that statement is 100% yeah, we... true. Yeah. You know, and some. You know, you can never put into words how bad things are um but you have to keep going you can't give up you know we have to show niall and the other children that actually do you know what we can live our lives again somehow we're, we're still we've got to tr try and figure out how we do that you know we've all got therapy and everything in place and we are hoping that with with an awful lot of help around us including our family and friends that we'll, we'll get there, we'll do it, you know? And our family and friends have been extremely affected as well. You know, they're all quite a few family members and friends who are pretty poorly too, after having watched everything in the last three years and a bit. You know, it's devastated many lives, not just, not just us parents and the siblings. So it was hell reading it, absolute hell. I knew I wasn't gonna be able to do it without 
okay. breaking, okay. um, but it had to be done. Yeah, done. Had to be done. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm still uh, in shock, I think. I'm still processing that we've actually got to this stage we've been fighting for for the last three years. I, I don't know Lisa, if it's really sunk in yet. That it's too early. It's, yeah. you know, we, it's been such a battle and such a relentless time that actually today is the day that it's been decided, you know, the judgment has been passed and the sentence has been passed and we as a family of fought off everything we can to get this and I'm immensely proud of these guys, mm -hmm. the family and uh, thank, you. Well, thank, thank you. you thank you to all of you for thank supporting you. us yeah. in this momentous day thank you, thank thank you. you. Such an emotional statement. what would it have meant about you as an actual been there oh my goodness me I mean she should have been there you know we would have been um, I think it's despicable that she didn't come over on the judge's orders. Cowardly. Um, yeah, huge, huge coward. You know, we, we had an option at the beginning of all of this to take things laying down and have Harry's life swept aside, or we stand up and fight and you face every hurdle that we've had to jump over many, many times in the last three years, three months. We weren't cowards. We didn't back away from the US government or the UK government in the, in, in the beginning. We didn't back down, you know, because we have values. Maybe she doesn't. And the judge paid tribute to you as a family for being so dignified. I mean, you've been through so much, going to the White House, meeting President Trump. Mm. How do you reflect on all of that today? Because you're here again now. It's going to take us an awful long time to sink everything in. You know, with, with the campaign work going along at the pace that it has done, you don't get time in between to really reflect on the fact you've just got back from the States or you've just met who was President Trump at the time. You don't get any time to reflect on one interview to the next either because it's on to the next one and it's on to the next part or the next meeting or the next Zoom or the next travel to London or Manchester or whatever. So I think now's our time to rest. Um, we're going to leave the next part of our campaign and. The capable hands of Rad and Isaac will be behind them 100%. You'll probably see us pop up um, in many places over the, the coming months and possibly even years to make sure that this never happens to another family ever again, certainly in this country. Um, that was also our number one aim, alongside getting our justice for Harry. Um, so, yeah, just watch this space. You know, we're going to continue to work to make sure that no one suffers like we have. The US government, uh, again, the same as her, despicable, really. You know, how on earth can they treat who is meant to be one of their closest allies in this way? You know, absolutely disgusted. I'm disgusted. Any other questions? What, what now, Charlotte? You, you touched on that a little bit, didn't you, just now? But, but what you've always wanted is, is Harry's inquest, so you can get the full detail of what happened that night. Yeah. It's, it's going to take us a while. You know, we're under no illusion it's not going to be next month. You know, we may get it before the end of next year, so there's a lot of work to do right. that Rad will take care of. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me add to that, Lisa, if that's OK. So, yeah, so the next step now is this family have been deprived of mm. their inquest. And an inquest is to determine how, how Harry came to meet his death. We still do not have any details of what happened to him that night, unbe unbelievably, after all this time. So the next phase of this campaign will, will, will turn to that. We don't know when that will be, but hopefully sometime next year. And it will be a very involved inquest, given that we now know that Harry was not the first person to die outside a, a United States Air Force base. There have been thousands of people killed or seriously injured over the decades at the hands of American drivers, and it must stop. So that will be a focus of the inquest. And then after that, you know, look, the way this family were treated at the outset, um, which shocked me, and which is why I went up the road, there are lots of lessons to be learned. We will be having a parliamentary inquiry into the whole 
uh, the whole scandal, really. And I think the Foreign Office have acknowledged today for the first time that they've learned lessons, but we want to work with them and Parliament to make sure that should this happen to another family again, they don't have to go through what this family uh, have been through. So these parents are heroes. They have to cope without their, without their son every day. But they are thinking about the next family down the road, and they're dedicating their lives to, to, to that project, which, uh, you know, I don't know how much comfort it gives them, but to go to bed at night and thinking that they are leaving a legacy for Harry and that his life did matter, um, that will make other people safer. I, these people are absolute heroes, in my view. The UK government have said tonight that they have learned lessons from Harry's case. Do you think they've learned enough? Well, um, in fact, just last night I, I learned that, that James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary, wants to meet, meet us, and, and we are just waiting to, to, to get that in, in the diary. Look, I think we'll be having extensive discussions with the, with the, with the Foreign Office. Um, and look, I, I, it has to be open and transparent. Have they learned the lessons? You know, only time will tell. I, I, I think I was involved in another case um, recently outside RAF Lake and Heath, where, I, where we worked with the Foreign Office. And in that case, they didn't let the person responsible go. And she will stay and face our justice system. So if that's anything to go by, yeah, it's, it, it's looking positive. Um, and look, that's all you can ever hope in life. People do make mistakes. Governments make mistakes. We don't believe that anybody was intentionally trying to harm, harm, harm us. But, you know, we have to do better next time. Do you see a point after all of this that you could find it in your heart to meet directly with Mrs. Spoons? I can't answer that today. Probably not. No, not for me either. No. Yeah, I think that's a that's a difficult question. I I've always encouraged it in the past to have what we call restorative justice meetings. They're very very powerful. When you have a, a offender in front of a victim and they talk to each other, but that is usually done fairly early on, and it does allow the parties to explain how they feel to each other. Maybe for the offender to express some remorse. But you know, as you know, and I think some of you were there. We were thrust into the Oval Office in 2019 with apparently Mrs. Sekoulis in the next room and had not been made aware that that was the purpose of our visit to the White House. And I called, I, I, I called an end to the meeting because you cannot meet the person who's just killed your son a few weeks earlier in the Oval Office with the world's media there, um, with President Trump, you know, going for his, you know, glory moment. I, you know, I thought it was the most disgraceful thing in, in the whole campaign. These people were, you know, just a few weeks on from losing Harry. They were like rabbits in a headlight. I had dragged them to the United States. And your poor Charlotte didn't even know where she was. She didn't know what the Oval Office was. And there was President Trump planning to ambush us with Mrs. Sekoulis in the next room. So yeah, different circumstances, maybe we would have met her. If they had done it properly, maybe. But not the way, yeah, listen, I'm so disappointed in the US government. I don't know what's going on in Washington at the Department of Justice and the State Department. Their decision-making matrices are seriously suboptimal and they need to have a think about how they behave. Um, and as Isaac said, you know, they want a war, They've got a war, and we are not going to let British citizens suffer at their hands anymore. Okay, any more questions? We done? Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you all guys. so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Pop back in, we'll go right back. So we're just hearing there from Harry Dunn's uh, family after... Uh, the conclusion to the case uh, against Anne Sekoulis, of course, has now been sentenced, a suspended uh, eight-month uh, sentence, uh, so won't, in fact, serve time. And, of course, Anne Sekoulis was not uh, there in person but joined from uh, the US via video uh, link. Uh, we heard Harry Dunn's uh, mother, Charlotte Charles, uh, say, job done, she felt, uh, in terms of their campaign, 
in the last uh, couple of years, uh, saying that Anne Sekoulis now has a criminal record for the rest of her life. And she said, Harry, uh, we've done it in that regard. She said she wasn't particularly concerned about the sentence itself, but much, uh, but much of what they've been doing the last uh, few years has been uh, about doing the right uh, thing. Uh, she continued to say that she could never put into words how bad things are, but she needs to show Niall, that's uh, Harry's twin, and her other children that they have their lives to live. Uh, as it relates to uh, Anne Sekula's physical absence in court today, uh, uh, Harry Dunn's mother said she should have been there and described uh, Anne Sekula's as a huge coward. Uh, she said, we weren't cowards, we didn't back down because we have values, maybe she uh, doesn't. And uh, uh, did also uh, say the US government has been despicable, she's disgusted by them, uh, and says, uh, how can uh, they treat one of their closest allies this uh, way? Uh, we did also hear from uh, Rad Seeger, who's the family spokesperson, in relation to the, uh, their views on the US government, saying that the real enemy is not Ms. Sekoulis who made a mistake, but the US government, instead of doing the right thing, uh, they decided to kick Harry's family in the stomach uh, and that they'd taken a cowardly approach throughout. Uh, Rad Seeger did also uh, comment on Mrs. Justice Chima Grubb uh, and paid tribute to the job she had done. And uh, let's listen back to uh, the judges, uh, some of the key comments she made during the sentencing. You were released from the court, but directed to attend in person for this sentencing hearing. I directed you to attend and observed that attendance in person would be strong evidence of remorse for the offence of causing the death of Harry Dunn by your careless driving. The sentence is eight months imprisonment suspended for 12 months. There will be no additional requirements. The sentence means that if in the next 12 months you commit any offence, whether or not it is of the same type for which I'm sentencing you today, you would find yourself before the court again. Uh, Sky Shingi Mariki is uh, at the Old Bailey and uh, Shingi clearly some scathing comments uh, towards certainly the US government, towards Anne Sekoulis uh, from Harry Dunn's mother, but at the same time uh, she was in a position to be able to say, job done. Yeah, absolutely. Listening to the family just outside court there was a reminder this is a diplomatic issue which has obviously been deeply personal for them and deeply hurtful. You had those strong words towards Anne Sekoulis, but when questioned by my colleague Lisa Dowd about how she was feeling, she essentially said, she looked up and she said, Harry, we've done it, in her own words. She, she felt like this part of the process is now complete. Their quest for justice and the principle, the idea that Anne Sekoulis has been sentenced in a UK court, even if she appeared via video link, that is now complete and I sat in and heard the proceedings over the course of the afternoon and what was most striking when we heard from from Harry's mother was just how difficult life has been without him she gave a witness impact statement in which she discussed her life since then and she said well she broke down in tears at various points and she said that she regretted not making it to hospital on time wishing she had left earlier to delay Harry leaving the house so she wasn't on the road so he wasn't on the road at the same time as Anne Sekoulis. Then she detailed the impact it had had on his twin, Niall, who is struggling with his mental health. She said that this was a void that their family will obviously never be able to fill. And on the diplomatic issues and on the relationship with America and the fact that Anne Sekoulis was not extradited, you heard those strong words outside of court by the family spokesperson. And he said that he felt that the US is obviously the UK's longest running or one of their longest running allies. And the fact that they did not do more to ensure that Anne Sekoulis appeared in UK court was a serious issue. They then went on to say that this saga, this story is not complete and that they will continue to push for justice and pursue, pursue matters as further along the line. Stay with us, sir, uh, because we just want to pivot and uh, get some footage in from our James Matthews in the US, uh, who caught up with Anne Sekoulis' uh, lawyers outside of their offices. Your family. Have a nice what, day. What words do you have for Harry Dunn's family today? Have a nice day. Have you compounded their grief by delaying justice for three years? Is three years too long for this family to wait for justice? How do you, why didn't you go to attend court in the UK? Thank you. 
You are not getting in this elevator, okay? Go ahead. You are not getting in this elevator. Excuse me, if you don't mind. You are not getting in this elevator. You are not getting in this elevator. Uh, Mr. Cullis, why, why did the, the Harry Dunn family have to wait for three years to see you receive justice today? What words do you, what words do you have for Harry Dunn's family? That was, in fact, uh, Ms. Sakoulis herself, uh, accompanied by her lawyers, as opposed to just her, her lawyers, uh, not making any comment, essentially, to James Matthews' uh, questions. Uh, let's go back to Lisa Dowd at the Old Bailey, uh, who's joined by some members uh, of Harry Dunn's family. Yeah, I'm joined by um, Harry's mum, Charlotte Charles, and the family spokesperson, Rad Seeger. And actually, Rad was just looking at that footage um, that James Matthews has sent to us from the United States, um, showing Mrs Sakulas, um, who wasn't answering any questions over Harry's case. Um, uh, Charlotte, I know you were on the phone just now to a family member, so you didn't get to see it, but... Um, what are your feelings towards Mrs Sakulas, given that she didn't turn up to court today and um, she only took part in proceedings from Washington? Oh, she's cowardly. You know, we could have backed down over three years ago and taken the cowardly route of not fighting. Um, we didn't do that. We jumped over many, many, many hurdles in the last three and a bit years and here we are today. So, yeah, unfortunately, there's no other word for it. She's Cowardly. She was watching over video link from the United States to a very emotional victim impact statement that you read out. Um, at one point, she apparently wiped away a tear. Can, can you take us through what you told the court? What impact this has had on your family? Uh, just how hard every day is. Um, the physical side effects as well as the mental side effects. You know, your body doesn't work the way it used to. Um, your, my menstrual system, um, you probably heard me talk about that. That's how it's had a massive effect on, on all of that. You know, we're, we're on antidepressants, um, prescribed diazepam, just to be able to function each day. You know, the gaping hole that is left, the void, that nothing can fill, because Harry's not here. You know, the amount of love and support that we get and the fact that I've got Niall and the other siblings helps me keep going, because, you know, they're my life. So, you know, so Harry should be here. We're having to live without him. And the day-to-day -day physical and mental impact that has had is That's just beyond it. horrific, you know? You, you're tearful one minute, you're angry the next, you're shaky, you st still, I still, after three years, get halfway through doing the mundane shop and leave the trolley and run to the car. You know, you can't, you sometimes can't control when it's going to hit you, and when it hits you, it hits you bad. Are you happy with the sentence she received today? The sentence was never anything that I was invested in. What I'm really happy with is that the job's done. Justice in a UK court has been done. That's what I promised my boy, and that's exactly what we've done. So I am good. I am thrilled that it's all over with. We need some time to absorb everything that's gone on. We need to get on with our therapy, and we need a bit of a rest over, over the next few weeks before this man here starts embarking on the next phase. Mrs Sakulas, we heard in court, has said that not a day goes by without her thinking about your son. What do you make of that? I think she should have said that an awful long time ago, you know, instead of leaving us to just think, bearing in mind we've never had any direct, direct contact from her at all. I think she should have been saying that an awful long time ago. You know, we've, we've been left for over three years, just assuming, as we've seen with your guys' help, that she's just getting on with her life, you know? Um, pretty unfair, really. And she is saying that she remains open to meeting with you and the family. Is that something you might consider going forward? 
Not anymore. You know, it was always on the cards to begin with. I, I never say never, but now, over three years, and without us fighting in our campaign for as long as we have and as strong as we have, we wouldn't be here today. You know, she wouldn't have come to us to offer to talk to us or go through the system. You know, it's what we have fought for as a team and as a family with the help of Rad and his family. That's why we're here. So I think the, the time for any contact and any remorse is long gone. And I think what particularly came across in court today was the true horror of that evening. We heard detail about the crash, about Harry's words. Um, he said, don't let me die to a witness, didn't he? Yeah, yeah he didn't want to die. He didn't want to die. He asked them to not let him die. You know, I have to live with that every day, every moment of every day, every waking moment, every minute of the night that you're laying there, you know, just him literally begging not to let him die. He wasn't ready to go. He shouldn't have gone. You know, there's no way that that boy should have been laying there for as long as he was either in that amount of pain, being so scared, and there's still so much more I've got to find out. But, yeah, harrowing to listen to and harrowing to know. And we heard from your victim impact statement how it has haunted you that you weren't able to get to the hospital in time to yeah. see Harry. Yeah, totally. We tried our best. You know, we, we went to pick Niall up immediately. We got the phone call from Tim. But he was... Harry was just too injured. You know, unfortunately, by the time we got there, he got... So I couldn't comfort him at all. I couldn't let him know that I was there. You know, so for me, the next best thing was to kiss that bruised lip of his and just let him know that I'll fight for justice. You know, and that's the promise that I made to him, was that I promised I would get him justice. And that's what's kept me going. That's been my driver, because I just couldn't get to him in time to tell him that I loved him. Because you were told, weren't you, um, after Harry's death, that you had a tiny chance of getting any... Uh, less than a 1% chance of getting justice, and that yeah. was, I think you said, from a police representative. Yeah. I suppose they hadn't reckoned on um, coming up against such a family. No, clearly not. And I think the police in this country have been so used to not being able to do anything about it, if you like, because it's happened to so many other families over many, many, many years now. You know, a lot of American service men and women have been flown home within 24, 48 hours of, of an incident occurring. Um, nobody's ever fought before. They've not had the, the, the ways and the means to, to fight before. You know, we've now got social media. We had a rad, as we say, you know, a friend of 20 years that, thankfully for us, wasn't, you know, he, he'd retired, had an awful lot of legal knowledge, you know, so for, we're doing that for all of those people as well and all of those families. And we're going to continue, we're going to, to continue to do that. But when we got told in my kitchen that we had a less than 1% chance of getting a conviction, there was an automatic no. We're not, we're not having this. We're not taking that laying down. Um, we asked the police to put us straight onto their press office and we went from there. So it was just never going to be accepted. And no one would have reckoned on your determination getting you to the White House to speak to President Trump to lobby him to do something. But of course he didn't. Did he? Can you can you give me your reflections at that time? You find yourself in the Oval Office with the President of the United States asking for help. Yeah, crazy. I mean, you know, Harry had only been gone a few weeks. I think, well, I definitely know, looking back, I was still very numb. The rest of the family was still very numb. Um, you're in... You're on automatic pilot mode. You just seem to float through the days, just not really knowing... Where, where your feet are touching the ground and nothing feels real anyway. And when the opportunity was presented to us by a rad to go and meet with him, we were like, well, we're here. We've got to give it a go, you know. Why not? You know, what have we got to lose? 
Um, we had absolutely nothing left to lose. We'd lost everything that we could have lost. So it was just a no-brainer. You know, Rad wasn't keen initially. He was worried. We didn't, we didn't get offered a, a UK representative to be with us. So we only had our Rad. Um, and it was just ridiculous. You know, they tried separating us from Rad. Um, I didn't know we were in the Oval Office. I'm not into politics. I didn't have a clue what it looked like. Didn't know where we were. Um, very scary, very daunting looking back on it and then to be told that she was in the next room and, yeah, bang out of order. We, none of us had any therapists with us, nobody, no UK advisor, you know, neither did she, as far as we're aware. Um, she had no mediators or therapists either, so it was totally and utterly the wrong thing to do and, yeah, quite frankly, just a, a bit of a... A PR stunt, I think. Yeah, I think your concern that night was that this was just going to be a photo op uh, for President Trump and Mrs. Sakoulas and that y you'd all be happy and you'd move on with your lives. Yeah, completely. And, you know, that became very evident because instead of us showing out, being shown out to the South Lawn where all of you guys and other people from the press were, we got promptly shown out the back door. And given the way you were treated and the way you have continued to be treated by the United States government, and at times the British government, how do you feel towards those two institutions now? It's a difficult one. I mean, the US is definitely, like, they're, they're, they are not my favourite people and they're never going to be, I don't think. The UK really let us down, bad, down badly in the beginning. They're, they're starting to come good, I think. But, um, yeah, I think I need to reserve judgment for now. And a final word to you, Rad. Um, this isn't the end completely, is it, that you've got more things that you want to happen now? Well, look, today is the end of the, the, the criminal phase. And, again, you know, the... The suggestion at the time was that this family were never going to get justice, and that was never going to happen. So today is victory day. Uh, less than 1% chance to me meant, nah, this is going to happen. Because that's not how we, how we live our lives in this country. We, we expect justice to be done. And we can, we can close this off now. And she had a, she's got a very serious sentence. And, you know, today is about thinking about Harry, and today is about thinking about the parents, and they're heroes in my view. But you're absolutely right, Lisa. We now move forward to the next phase of our campaign, which again, heroically, the, the, the parents want to leave a legacy for Harry, which is that this will never happen again. And that is a, a very complicated issue, and yeah, that's where we're turning to now. Thank you both for joining us live on Sky News. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. So there you see um, a lasting legacy for Harry. Um, no, um, the family are not wanting to meet with Mrs. Sakulas. Um, they're wanting to move on. Um, they want to have an inquest um, into his death. So they find out the full facts of what happened uh, that night and they want a parliamentary inquiry as well to go through the circumstances of what happened and to try to ensure that this never happens to another family. The treatment uh, both that they um, received from the British government at the start of this but also uh, the US government as well. It's uh, Mark Austin here now. I just what you followed this so closely. I just wanted to ask you, I mean, clearly the conclusion uh, of a very long and painful bat battle for the family and the mother that you have just been speaking to there. Yeah, when I first spoke to Charlotte, Harry's mum, about this, um, what struck me is that they didn't get wind that Mrs Sakulas had left the country until Harry's funeral. Nobody told them, nobody kept them in the loop. So until then, they felt like the case was relatively straightforward. They knew who was involved. She was cooperating with police. Um, they felt like all the proceedings were going on as they should. And then out of the blue, uh, they find out that the suspect has left the country.
and they understand that she might have some kind of diplomatic role, some kind of diplomatic protection. And of course, they are thrown into a, a totally new world that involves um, American spies, uh, an American military base. Um, the uh, President of the United States of America, uh, the British government, um, the police, and they're trying to process all this, they're trying to deal with all this, but at the very heart of it for them was getting justice for their son, who was killed in a terrible crash, and for that, um, after three years of fighting, they finally have um, some kind of justice. Mrs Sekoulas has voluntarily taken part in, this, uh, in these proceedings, albeit remotely via video link from Washington, but they do feel that they've brought her to justice, um, albeit kicking and screaming in a way. And in spite of her showing her remorse, um, they, they don't want to hear it. It's too late for them. Uh, they wish she'd have just come back to the UK for this sentencing. sentencing. Um, but of course, she was never going to do that. OK, Lisa, thank you very much indeed. Let's just uh, remind you then of what's happened in the past uh, couple of hours. Job done, they were the words of Charlotte Charles outside the Old Bailey after a judge sentenced a former US spy for causing the death of her son, Harry Dunn. Ever since the 19-year-old was killed when he was knocked off his motorbike by Anne Sekoulis in uh, August 2019, his family have campaigned to bring her to justice. This afternoon, Mrs Sekoulis received an eight-month suspended sentence Harry's mother said it was despicable that Mrs Sekoulis had chosen not to travel to the UK uh, to appear in court in person. Let's hear what Mrs Justice Chima Grubb, KC, had to say. I directed you to attend and observed that attendance in person would be strong evidence of remorse. Failure of a defendant in a criminal trial to attend in person when directed to do so without reasonable cause is an offence contrary to the Bail Act. It has the potential to affect the court's ability to administer justice by damaging the confidence of victims, witnesses and the public more generally in the effectiveness of the court system. For the offence of causing the death of Harry Dunn by your careless driving, the sentence is eight months imprisonment suspended for 12 months. There will be no additional requirements. The sentence means that if in the next 12 months you commit any offence, whether or not it is of the same type for which I'm sentencing you today, you would find yourself before the court again. Well, speaking outside court, Harry's mother, Charlotte, said she had now fulfilled her promise to him. Job done. Promise complete. Properly, properly complete now. You know, Anne Sekoulis has a criminal record for the rest of her life. Um, that was something that, you know, they never, she never thought she'd see, the US government never thought that they'd see. And we've worked tirelessly and relentlessly to make sure that she, in the end, still had to do what you and I would have had to have done. So, yeah, Harry, we've done it. And we're good, <laughs> we're good. Well, Anne Sekoulis has refused to answer questions as she left her lawyer's office in uh, the United States. Sky's James Matthews caught up with her. Have a nice day. What, what words do you have for Harry Dunn's family today? Have a nice day. Have you compounded their grief by delaying justice for three years? Is three years too long for this family to wait for justice? How do you, why didn't you go to attend court in the UK? Thank you. You are not getting in this elevator, okay? Go ahead. You are not getting in this elevator. Excuse me, if you don't mind. You are not getting in this elevator. You are not getting in this elevator. Uh, Mr. Cullis, why, why did the, the Harry Dunn family have to wait for three years to see you receive justice today? What words, do you, what words do you have for Harry Dunn's family? Anne's coolest there, unwilling to uh, answer the questions of James Matthews. Uh, she has, however, issued 
a statement saying this. I want to again extend my sincerest condolences to Harry Dunn's family and friends. Apologies for that. We will get the uh, statement up uh, in just a moment. Uh, my tragic mistake, she said, led to the loss of Harry and I live with this regret every single day. There is not a day that goes by that Harry isn't on my mind and I am deeply sorry for the pain that I have caused. It's for this reason that I have been so committed to a resolution to this case since 2019. I know there is nothing I can say to change what has happened. I only hope that the truth and a resolution to this case will bring a measure of comfort and peace. As always, I remain willing to meet and apologise to Harry's family directly if that would support their healing. Harry was a young man with his whole life ahead of him. I cannot imagine the loss and I too deeply grieve for Harry and his family. I am grateful that I could express my profound remorse to the court and to Harry's friends and family. Uh, August 27th, 2019 changed the lives of so many and I pray for healing. I kindly ask the uh, media for privacy. Thank you.